Uh, my name is Rafe Esquith. I'm a teacher in Los Angeles, California. And I always say this to an audience, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm a real lucky teacher. And I've been the National Teacher of the Year, and I've been honored by the Queen and a couple of presidents and the Dalai Lama. The only thing of which I'm proud is that after 28 years, I am still a classroom teacher. That's what I do for a living. I don't, yeah, thank you. There's, there's a lot of magic at an event like this, but I have to be the person to remind you, there's an age old question. Would you rather have your child in a room with the best equipment in the world with an average teacher or an empty room with Socrates? If we're really going to fix the problems of education, technology will not do it. We must get the right people in front of these children. And we have to, we don't like to talk about that because that's a harder problem to solve. I, this is EG, and normally when I speak, I go on for hours about how to be a teacher. That's not our mission here. We're here to entertain you. I do want to just tell you that I teach at a school called Hobart Elementary School, a Los Angeles urban nightmare. 92% of the kids are below the poverty level. None of the children you're about to meet speak English as their first language. And here's the statistic that kills me. 32% of the children at Hobart Elementary School, only 32% finish high school. Now that either means we've got the stupidest children on the planet or our system is failing. And everybody in this room knows the answer to that question. I got to Hobart 25 years ago and I have tried very hard to break that cycle. And I've had a little bit of success. I think it's really perfect that we're in the John Steinbeck Theater. Because if you know Steinbeck's great novel, The Pearl, Kino the Fisherman dreams of a future for his child where his child can open the books and understand the language because he knows that language will open the doors for his child. Now, I wanted to give you a little glimpse, because I feel the same way, of what it's like to be an elementary school teacher in Los Angeles. I got to Hobart School 25 years ago, and I met kids who weren't going anywhere, so I had an idea. Since I like Shakespeare, I thought I would stay after school to teach the kids something about Shakespeare. But Hobart has alarms that are set at 3 o'clock. So I made the first mistake, the worst mistake a teacher can ever make. The first rule of teaching is never ask permission. But I did. I wrote a proposal for the folks downtown, and I said, I'm going to stay late after school. I'm going to teach Shakespeare to the children. You don't have to pay me. It's fine. But when the alarms go off, it's just us in room 56. Don't worry about it. The proposal was rejected. And I got a letter that said, Rafe, we don't want you to teach Shakespeare. We would rather have you do something academic. <laughs> it's a true story. So I was a young teacher, and I was a coward. So I you know, fell to the pressure. And that first year of teaching, we did Thornton Wilder's great play, Our Town. You all know Our Town by Thornton Wilder? You know, it's an easy set. It's a wonderful play. And I didn't call down town to find out if Thornton Wilder was academic. Anyway, we spent the year learning our town. The kids put on a great show at the end of the year. And I invited the region superintendent of Los Angeles schools to watch our town in 1986. She loved the show. She cried at the end when Emily died. She came up to me and said, Rafe, I've never seen Shakespeare done better. True story. So before you meet the kids, I just wanted to give you a little insight, a little bit of the philosophy of Room 56. I've got to remind everybody here, as we desperately look for successful stories in education, we look at testing. Folks, I got to tell you, the test at the end of the year is meaningless. No matter how many times they say, hey, we're at 85, the real test is what have we given a child that they're going to use 10 years from now, 15 years from now, not for your class, but for the rest of their lives. The kids you're about to meet are not Shakespearean actors. They don't want to be Shakespearean actors. They're not. This has nothing to do with Shakespeare. Watch their discipline. Watch their needle-sharp stillness for one another. They have been sitting here for two hours with no chance to warm up. 
None. And they didn't get a sound check either. They're coming cold on a strange stage. And they're going to make mistakes. I'm not going to be on the stage. Usually you come to these events and the charismatic teacher leads the kids to victory. I'm over there. I got nothing to do with this. This is all about them. It must be. And that's what I want you to understand. And I'm going to offend a few people here. I really apologize. Before I offend you, please remember that Socrates was the best teacher who ever lived, and they killed him, right? <laughs> the philosophy of this class, I was laughing. Mike, who was so wonderful to us, Mike, when he heard I was bringing a group of kids, said, Rafe, we'll get you some chaperones. My philosophy is if kids need chaperones on the road, they shouldn't be on the road. I can take 60 kids. There are no chaperones. These kids have internalized a set of values of hard work and discipline and a love of learning that carries them. And that's why my students all finish at the top universities. If you go to HobartShakespeareans.org, that website was created by two of my former students who are graduate engineers out of Berkeley. The Hobart Shakespearean Foundation was created by one of my former students who's a graduate of Yale Law School and is now a professor of law at Marquette University. This is the test of teaching. What happens to them 20 years later? Let's always remember that as we look for success stories. This is a fast food society and we've got to put on the brakes. To be good at anything takes a long time. Shakespeare is a very small part of their day. These kids are good at writing. They read everything. They're brilliant in mathematics. They're great artists. Shakespeare's just a small part of their day. How do they get there? Well, first of all, we don't play video baseball. We play baseball. We don't play Guitar Hero. We play the guitar. We don't trick around with the Shakespeare and rap the Shakespeare. We speak Shakespeare the way Shakespeare wrote it because we respect his art. And we want to give tribute to his art and those brilliant words. As Ian McKellen has said about this group, the best thing about the Hobart Shakespeareans is that they know what they're saying. And that can't be said for all professional Shakespearean actors. <laughs> You're going to hear the words today, everybody says this, as you have never heard them before. Because of the absolute command that these 10 and 11 year olds, who do not speak English as their first language, are going to show you. Also, keep this in mind, the Royal Shakespeare Company has called them the absolutely ultimate example of how and why Shakespeare should be performed. So, thank you for staying, thank you listening for my words, and now here are my favorite words. Ladies and gentlemen, the Hobart Shakespeareans. of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princess to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine sword and fire, crouch for employment. But pardon, gentle song, if flat unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object? Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or, may, or maybe cram within this wooden O, the very cats that af did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest a little place a million, and let us, Cypress to his great account on your imaginary forces work. For tis your thoughts that now must like our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er time, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the witch supply, omit me chorus to this history, who prologue light to your humble patience prays, gently to hear, kindly to judge, our play. Those are the words of the chorus, a character in Henry V, a play by William Shakespeare, who we came here today, today to honor. When we first heard we were performing for you, we were really nervous. <laughs> What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, 
my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. But if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. Rather, proclaim thee, my cousin Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, crowns for convoy put into his purse. He shall not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that lives this day and sees old age will sit yearly on the vigil Feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian's day. Then shall he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember, with advantages, what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, shall be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin and Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. We in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhood's sheep, whilst any speaks upon Saint Crispian's day! Yay! So, here we are. How did Shakespeare discover and fall in love with the theater? There he was, living in this tiny little village in the geographical center of England. Only 1,500 people in Stratford when he was a boy there. What well, could any of them possibly know about the theater? Well, it's certain, isn't it, that he attended the free grammar school there in Stratford. <laughs> Latin grammar and Greek those boys learned there. Uh, no girls allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, did you creep like snail unwillingly? I'll bet he raced along to read the tragedies of Seneca and lighter comedies of Plautus, some of whose own plots he stole later on for his own plays. But reading a play in a foreign language and writing one of your own, how could he have done that? Simple, because every summer when the plague sometimes hit London, the actors would take their show on the road to small towns, as I believe actors always should. So, one summer morning, William opens the front door on Henley Street, looks out, and sees a horse. Nothing remarkable about a horse, but wait a minute, he's trotting along the London Road over Clopton Bridge, covered with dust, which still crosses the River Avon to this day. And maybe, on his back, is the young, dashing, and upcoming actor Richard Burbage in his satin suit with a plume in his cap, preceded by the town crier and his bell. Oh yes, the best actors in the world. Dogs barking. <laughs> and young William running behind. The actors, 
set up their stage in the open air. A simple stage, rather like this one. Nothing much at the back but an old curtain. Simple furniture and costume. Young William, ears, eyes, and mouth wide open. And maybe, after the performance, meeting the actors, changing his life and ours forever. There was another young man whose life was utterly changed by meeting actors, Prince Hamlet. to live, I want to give, I've been a miner for a heart of gold, it's these expressions I never give, that keeps me searching for a heart of gold, and I'm getting old, keeps me searching for Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force a soul so to his own conceit, that from her working, all his visage wan? Tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit and all for nothing? For Hecuba? What is Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? What would he do? Had he the motive and cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with hard speech. Make mad the guilty and appalled the free. Confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and money meddled rascal, can beak like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. I've been to Hollywood, I've been to Redwood, I crossed the ocean for a heart of gold. I've been in my mind, it's such a fine line that keeps me searching for a heart of gold, and I'm getting old. me searching for a heart of gold and I'm getting old Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pit across. 
plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the line the throat as deep as the lungs. Who does this to me, huh? Soon as I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon liver, pigeon livered and lack God to make oppression bitter, or ere this I should have fatted all the raging kites with the slaves up. Bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain, a vengeance! What a mass am I? This is most brave. Did I? Son of a dear father murdered, prompted for my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a horror, unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab scullion, fie upon it, foe. About my brain, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting in a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to so that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions for murder. Though it has no tongue, will speak with its most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'm tentative to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit I have seen may be the devil. And the devil hath powers to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and melancholy, as he is very potent to such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing where we'll now catch the conscience of the king. Keeps me searching for a heart of gold Keeps me searching and I'm growing old Keeps me searching for a heart of gold I've been a miner for a heart of gold So Hamlet goes on to write some dozen or sixteen lines into the actor's speech. And he even gives it a new title. He calls it The Mousetrap. And 400 years later, Agatha Christie stole that title for her own play, <laughs> which is now the longest running play in history of world theater. Recently, there was a tourist in London standing in the rain and waiting for a taxi. When one arrived, he said, take me to the Mousetrap Theater. And all through the journey, he was grumbling about British rain and British taxis to the taxi driver. He arrived safely, but did not leave a tip. Just as he was stepping inside to see the most famous thriller who done it of all time, the taxi driver wound down his window and shouted after him, the detective did it! <laughs> so, if you haven't seen The Mousetrap, you needn't bother now. Shakespeare was a complicated writer. Henry V is a history, but it is both full of comedy and tragedy. It is true of, um, of one of his most complex plays, The Merchant of Venice. In the play, according to her father's wishes, Portia throws away every suitor after only one date.
tragedy in the Merchant of Venice as Shylock explodes at the prejudice he has experienced. And what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes. Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions. Fed with the same food. Hurt by the same weapons. Subject to the same diseases. Healed by the same means. Warmed and cooled by the same summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? Do it and do it again. Waste me. Rape me, my friend. I'm not the only Humility. We 
revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should the sufferings be by Christian example? Why? Revenge! The villainy you teach me, I shall execute and shall go hard. But I will better the instruction. there are serious moments. In As You Like It, Rosalind and her friend Celia must run away from Celia's threatening father. As I walk along, I wonder oh, what went wrong with our love, a love that was so strong. The things we've done together uh, While our hearts were young I'm a walking in the rain Tears are falling and I feel the pain Wishing you were here by me human experience.
their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. So she took her love for two games. puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school, and then the lover sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow, and then the soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. See the whisper move like a lover's soul among the fields of barley. Feel her body rise when you kiss her mouth among the fields of gold. severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth stage shifts into the lean and slippery pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side. His youthful hose, well saved, a world too wide for a shrunk shame and big manly voice, turning again toward childish treble, pipes, and whistles in a sound. strange eventful history, the second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Many years have passed since those summer days among the fields of barley. See the children Excuse me for having a drink when you're not allowed to have one. 
The human vocal system was not made to speak for long periods of time without some lubrication. If you ever have a problem with your voice, don't talk. That's the quickest way to mend a broken voice. But if you have to talk, you could do worse than to try this homemade remedy, which is simply fresh squeezed lemon juice, poured in with runny honey, and stirred around until it's all dissolved. Then let it trickle down the back of your throat. It's good. <laughs> Actually, it's gin. <laughs> and the magic of the theater is, you'll never know. And then, right at the height of his fame, his success and financial reward, Shakespeare retired. He went back home to Stratford, where he bought the biggest house in town, New Place. And there, with his wife and family, lived happily ever after. And then, on his 52nd birthday, which was a good age for those years, some of his friends gave him a birthday party. Shakespeare and his friends drank into the early morning. He complained of a cold, went upstairs to bed, and died peacefully in his sleep. He had made no attempt to publish his plays. Hamlet, as far as he knew, died with him. And it was only after his death that a couple of his friends got together and said, this won't do. So they gathered all of Shakespeare's plays and published them in the one volume, the one first folio. And these two friends were not printers or publishers. They were not academics. They were not scholars. I love it. They were actors. They'd been in the plays. They knew what they were worth. So they saved them for us. So please, remember their names, John Hemmings and Henry Condell, without whose diligence and love, we would not even know that there was a play called Twelfth Night, my favorite, I think, or Truly Caesar, or his last play, The Tempest. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the basis fabric of this vision, the cloud capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We, we are such stuff as dreams are made of. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. Let it go But if 
nobody here who thinks that Shakespeare didn't write his plays. There are some people who just can't stand the thought that a perfectly middle-class man from the middle of nowhere arrived in London and wrote the plays. They even write books to prove their odd little theories. Some people, intellectual snobs perhaps, like to think that the philosopher Francis Bacon wrote the plays. And then there are social snobs who like to think that the Earl of Oxford wrote the plays. And somewhere, no doubt, is a keen viewer of Masterpiece Theater who likes to think that Alastair Cook wrote the plays. <laughs> Mark Twain put it very well. He said that in his point of view, the plays are either written by a man called Shakespeare or a man calling himself Shakespeare. We agree. So always remember, if you cannot understand my argument and declare this Greek to me, you are coding Shakespeare. If you claim to be more sinned against than sinning, you are coding Shakespeare. If you require your salad days, you are coding Shakespeare. If you act more in sorrow than in anger. If you wish as far as the thought. If your lost property has vanished into thin air, you, you are coding Shakespeare. If you have ever refused to budge an inch. Or suffer from green eye jealousy. If you played fast and loose. If you have ever been to the tongue tied. A tower of strength. Hoodwinked during a pickle. If you've knitted your brows. Made a virtue of necessity. Insisted on fair play. Slept not one wink. Stood on ceremony. Danced attendance. On your lord and master. Laughed yourself into stitches. Had short shrift. Cold comfort. Or too much of a good thing. If you have seen better days. Or lived in a fool's paradise. Why be that as it may. The more fool you. For it is a foregone conclusion that you are, as good luck would have it, quoting Shakespeare. 
If you think it is early days and clear up bag and baggage, you think it is high time, but that is a long short of it. If you believe that the game is up and the truth will out, even if it involves your own flesh and blood, if you lie low to the crack of doom because you suspect foul play, if you have your teeth set on edge, at one false swoop, without rhyme or reason, then to give the devil his due, if the truth were known, for surely you have a tongue in your head, you are quoting Shakespeare. Even if you've been me gervered and sent me packing. If you wish I was dead as a doornail. If you think I'm an eyesore. A laughing star. The devil incarnate. A stony hearted villain. Bloody minded. Or a blinking idiot. Then by Joe. Oh Lord. Tut tut. For goodness sake. What the dickens? But me no buts. It is all one to me, for you are. Quoting Shakespeare.